Okay, guys, we are back. 2022 real estate market forecast. We have Art Carter, the CEO of CRMLS, back in the chair. Um, we did the in-studio with Art last year. I can't remember if we did in-studio with you two years ago, but Art has participated in our forecast now, uh, I don't know, three or four or five times maybe. Um, the last year or two, we said, okay, no more panels for Art. Art has way too much information, and to put him on a panel with two or three other people just doesn't do it justice. So let's set the stage a little bit. Um, Art's introduction, 17 years um, at CRMLS um, as CEO the whole entire time? Yes. The entire, wow, the entire time. Um, let's not go back and relive who was there before you. I, I, my memory is, <laughs> is gone. But anyway, 17 years with CRMLS, 20 plus years doing industry related stuff. So if you're looking for our market forecast data, which is kind of what our whole theme of our market forecast is. You know, we've broken out our forecast into two different pieces. The economist folks, which is not me, um, and then the industry guys, which is art and me, what's going on with real estate, what's going on with our industry. Um, to the degree that you have an opinion on the market and you want to give it, you, you know, we'll take your forecast as well. So anyway, Art, welcome. Thank you for having me, Lance. It's been a... I don't think I've seen you since we were in here a year ago. No, no, yeah. it, it's been uh, it's been a COVID fun ride. Another uh, year, year two. Yes. Which I think maybe we were just talking before the uh, before the sit down here. Looks like CAR is getting together here in a month or so. Legislative day. That feels good, doesn't it? Yeah, being um, back in in conferences feels good. I right. I was back in a live conference for the first time at the end of February, and it was really nice to see people. Right. Yeah. It, we the things we take for granted. Yeah. Exactly. And now we're we're back. Um, so um, it's been a year. Um, let's. I think last year we started off with the real fun topics. What's going on, leg not legislatively necessarily, but legally that impacts our industry, CRM, CRMLS specifically. I know you can't talk about everything, so let's just leave those off the top, unless you want to say, I can't talk about this. But um, so what's going on that our realtor membership, this may not necessarily apply to many of you. If you're a buyer or seller in the property management side, you may not be quite as interested in this part of what Art has to say. But if you're a real estate agent in our world, we all need to be listening to Art right now. So what's, what's happening out there that, that we need some, some information on? Well, I mean, there's a lot of lawsuits going on, yep. and those lawsuits are very specific in what they're looking for out of the industry as a whole. Uh, it's not just, you know, in the past, it's, you know, my 25 years of doing this, you, the lawsuits will always pop up where, you know, NAR will make a rule and people will sue them over that. But it's a very concerted effort on, on a number of different, uh, very high-powered plaintiff attorneys' uh, behalfs to potentially change the way that real estate is done. And right. uh, there are seven lawsuits out there that deal either with the buy side or the sell side commission yep. and wanting to make changes in the way that real estate agents offer and accept commission in a real estate transaction. So those things are, uh, they're a little bit long, longer tooth, um, but recognize that that they're all kind of intertwined together. Right. And the reason why they're intertwined together is because for the first time, uh, the Department of Justice and the FTC have taken a, a very keen interest in these lawsuits. They've taken a keen interest in the way that commissions are being paid out in the real estate industry. Uh, the Department of Justice and NAR in 2019 had reached a agreement to avoid a lawsuit between NAR and the Department of Justice. Yep. It seems about every 10, 12 years, the Department of Justice sues NAR for something. They come to a consent decree, and we learn to live with the, the new regulations in regards to whatever the Department of Justice had a concern about. Uh, the Department of Justice and NAR in 2012 you know, came to another agreement. Uh, in 2ongitude the Department of Justice, uh, with a change in the administration, decided that they was no that longer... Was that 2021? 2021 was the, when the Department of Justice backed out of the consent decree. That they had agreed to in 19. Exactly. So just a couple of months ago, they came out and said, and again, for those of you that kind of follow this stuff, you got an email from Inman or got an email from CAR mm -hmm. that says, oh, or NAR, that says, oh, the agreement that we thought we had, we don't have. Correct. And so uh, basically the Department of Justice wanted some changes in the way that real estate agents searched for properties within the MLS system. They wanted changes in the way that uh, the attribution on IDX was, was displayed. 
they definitely want the consuming public to know what the selling office compensation is. Yeah. So those pieces were, were part of the consent decree. Uh, and Department of Justice backed out of those. Right. And uh, basically NAR sued the Department of Justice to get them to, to adhere to what they felt was a binding agreement between right. the two organizations. Uh, what's really telling uh, that, is, that is interesting, and I, I can put it up on the CRMLS website, uh, it's very easily uh, accessible on the internet, but the Department of Justice uh, wrote an opinion back to the, the court answering uh, NAR's lawsuit. And the Department of Justice made it very clear that they feel that the real estate industry is overpaid. Uh, they feel oh. that that okay. the market and where they're exactly getting these figures from, you know, is kind of up to, to supposition at this point. But it's a hundred billion dollar a year uh, figure that goes into brokers and agents' uh, pocketbooks, uh, or their assumption is. And right. their their uh, their claim is that the real estate industry has not been affected by technology like other. Uh, industries have been affected, and therefore the consumer is paying, overpaying billions of dollars a year. Hmm. That is the Department of Justice's response right. uh, is along those lines. And, and our advocate to educate them on that, I mean, goodness gracious, I mean, there's maybe some validity in certain parts of what they're arguing, um, you know, disclosing what compensation is. I mean, kind of hard to argue against that. But to say our, our industry has not been affected by technology, I mean, goodness gracious, how could, I mean... It doesn't take much of a third-party observer to sit back and say, "Are certainly been affected by technology." And, and you very well know, you know, sitting in the seat that you sit in, and you know, agents uh, know very well that just because that figure might be a, a hundred billion dollar figure, and it, a lot of it is driven by yep. by the underlying property values, but yep. your costs um, have as, yeah. as much and as much as everything in this country, you know, is is gone up. Uh, from an inflationary standpoint, so okay, there's so a lot of lot of marketing dollars and things that come out of that that element. That right. it's not just like all of that money is flowing back into right. Your pocket, it all ends so. up in the agent's pocket. Now, of course, there's a lot of hands in the pie. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I think I know the answer to these questions. So, of course, I'm asking questions so you can yeah. educate the audience. But the reality is, I, I think I have a general idea. But I'm, I have a feeling I'm going to learn something here. So if the, if the core, if the crux of it is, oh my gosh, you know, real estate industry has paid too much. And part of what, just to repeat what you said, is they want to make sure the buyer understands what the, like, I guess what the overall compensation is, not just what their agent is getting, but what the listing agent is getting. Okay, so we obviously disclose that to a seller. I mean, the seller agrees to pay what the commission is. So if they felt it was too much, there's more than one brokerage out there with more than one model to, to um, in effect, they can, they can just the consumer, at least on the list, listing side, can choose. So, is is a big part of what the what the DOJ is trying to do is just is it just is it my oversimplifying it to say we got to make sure the buyer also understands what the overall compensation is because they feel that maybe that compensation is being passed on to the buyer and they're indirectly paying it anyway. So, I think they're looking for a reset. They're looking for a change in the way that commissions are paid in the real estate industry. So tie in with the, what is going on between the, uh, the National Association of Realtors and Department of Justice in with these lawsuits. Okay. And so I said that there were seven that had to deal with the commissions. Um, there are a number that deal with the sell side. Um, the lawsuits basically are making the assertion that uh, sellers are paying for a broker's agent's commission and therefore are overpaying. Okay. So, uh, the when you other, say a broker agent's commission, you mean the buy the side? Buyer, the buy, the buy side. side. So okay. um, there's this assumption that they've been overpaying some you know, level you know, over the past uh, seven to ten years, I think, is what some of the lawsuits are claiming. You want to the, break that back? Well, that's... <laughs> I mean... That's, so let's, let's dive into this. So on, right. on, on the buy side, um, they're suing because as a buyer walking into a transaction you are not negotiating what your agent is getting paid right. in that, in that uh, transaction. It is what is contractually offered through the multiple listing service yep. uh, in most cases. But the buyer ultimately gets to know what that is. Yeah, they get to know it, but they don't get to negotiate what their, their agent is getting paid. Okay, at least, so, not, at least not up front. Not up front. They so, might get to negotiate it when they get the yeah. CD later on that says, yeah. oh, wait a minute, you know, maybe yeah. you're going to pay for some of my roof repairs or yeah. whatever. There, there is... Would, 
There is some element of that, but the Department of Justice has written amicus briefs in a number of these cases. And amicus briefs are, you know, the Department of Justice acting as a friend of the court. Right. And they have come down on the side of the plaintiffs in every single one of these cases. Uh, the general consensus is that what these lawsuits are looking to do is to create a real estate industry in which buyer's agents contract and pay for their own representation right. and sellers pay for only their representation. So the industry would, in effect, go to a listing broker and a buyer broker agreement, which have been around forever. Yeah, um, but, but, you, but guys have, you guys have this difficulty in, in embracing a, a buyer's agent uh, representation. I don't agreement. know that we have difficulty with it because, again, I can't speak for other parts of the country. And you know better. You travel yeah. all over, and you're, you're, you're way deeper knowledge on this than I am. So, but certainly within the market that I know, Inland Empire, Southern California, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I can remember 34 years ago, someone introduced me to a buyer's broker agreement through at the time, the old handwritten forms. I'm mm -hmm. like, wow, this is cool. Um, and actually I, do, I actually, I thought that. I think, oh, wow, this is cool. And you try to put that into practice, and you sit down it's, with the buyer difficult. and says, oh, and by the way, you, know, you barely have a down payment closing cost. Oh, and you need to pay me X. So you know, and maybe part of the argument with DOJ, I'm going to make their argument, I guess, is it's been easier for us to roll that in on the seller side, just kind of say, well, you're not paying us, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. It's just kind of built into the transaction, and that's how it's been forever. Um, so don't worry about that. You just worry about your down payment and closing costs. So is that is that basically partially what the reset is? Because that, that would know, truly change a lot. It, it would change um, a lot. And you know, right now, all of the commissions basically get uploaded into the loan that yep. the the buyer um, finances if it's not a cash transaction. Right. Um, so. You know, in this in this new world, potentially, you know, you're being looking at a situation where there are lending concerns, there are, you know, there are appraisal concerns. Um, right. You know, you you look at the underlying data, and the underlying data of cost of a of a home, there's some element of of commissions built into that that piece of it. Sure. And if we if, won't say what a percentage is, what, yeah, but, just, but it's it, but it, it's, it's a piece. It's yeah. a piece. And yeah. so, you know, how do you how do you unravel some of that stuff, right. you know, from a, a, an appraisal standpoint? Right. My biggest concern is, you know, the Biden administration during uh, summer last summer uh, put out an executive uh, um, executive order in regards to not just not just real estate, but the economy as a whole, and they wanted to look at the competitive balance of our economy, and the FTC has been put into a position of a position of looking at illegal tying situations in the real estate industry. And Say tying. What do you mean by tying? So that's an antitrust term. And so basically, you know, an example would be that, you know, if, if I walked into a, a store and every time I bought a Coke, um, there was, you know, a candy bar wrapped to it. Okay. You know, there, there, there is some illegal tying of services. Some of escrow, title, mortgage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, is is there some illegal tying of, right. of services in that the consumer is paying additional money for that they may ne not necessarily want or need? So that's what they're looking at. But the commission piece absolutely is a is a key part of that. Right. Um, the Department of Justice has to litigate to make changes, litigate or negotiate to make changes in anything that goes on. The FTC doesn't have to do that. They are a regulatory agency. Okay. They could walk in and um, probably get in trouble for saying this, but by fiat say, here's the new rules right. and how are things are going to roll. Right. And my biggest concern is... And that is, would not be litigated. They would just would basically not be litigated. draft would the just, new rules. They would and, draft new So new we rules. want to stay away from you know, that. They, they've, they've, they've kind of gone to the first step. Um, you know, they, they put out the new rules in regards to desktop, desktop appraisals. Yep. And the fact that you know, some of those things are going to be changing, that's just kind of the first step that the FTC is, is potentially going to go down with the department or with the, with the individual real estate uh, mm. industry uh, going down the road. Wow. Well, these are big. These are these are not They're small huge. things. They're huge. And, yeah. and you said that you know property managers. I think everybody that that is a real estate practitioner is going to be affected in some way by right. how these things. So if you had to, and I don't want to hold you to it, but let's ask you to forecast this. So are we? Is this something that's going to take years to 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 get through the end of the pipeline before we know what this looks like, or are we are we twelve months away, or well, or is it going I, to be incremental? I, I can tell you that 
you know, because this has an effect on the the multiple listing service. Okay. So, you know, offers of compensation potentially could not be, you know, a part of the multiple listing service going forward. So, we're always trying to look out, and it I was thinking, it would remove that. It would remove it. It would remove it because if the buyer's paying for the, you know, well, their own commission and well, the sellers, there is okay. no offer of compensation right. that flows to the multiple listing service. Right. So. Uh, we're always looking at those things. I was thinking uh, 12 to, to, to 18 months was the time frame that, you know, would take the FTC. They're going through this process of hiring, you know, 400 new attorneys, and it takes a while. Um, there's nothing for, for this topic? For, <laughs> for competition topics okay. in the economy. And there's nothing better than new attorneys right. to, uh, to figure out. Right. Very complex marketplaces, and the real estate is a very complex marketplace. Right. So I was assuming 12 to 18 months, but with what's going on with with Russia, and I, I think there there might be some some bigger fish to Maybe fry. Maybe some so, more, yeah, some more important so issues to concern. I with. I think that you know some of these things have probably been put on the back burner for a period of time, especially with inflation and everything that's going on. Um, you know, real estate is such a huge part of, of well, the Well, everybody economy. wants a piece of it. Well, oh, it'll yeah. be interesting. All, not all, but certainly some of the disruptors. Actually, I'm just, I was going to say something. I just stopped myself mid-sentence. I was going to say some of the disruptors that look, you know, let's just say the, the Wall Street hedge fund types that say, you, I think you gave me a number. I should know this. The, the real estate industry is a how many billion dollar a year um, business? What, what, just what, maybe well, and, and commissions a hundred billion. Okay, hundred billion. You know, okay. and and you know, you're, you're seeing figures like twenty billion dollars of prop tech investment money flowing into to real estate because they see a big number. So yeah. they're like, hey, let's go in and see if we can, you know, enter the industry and maybe disrupt the brokerage model a little bit, which has been going on for years. Um, but not, my, not saying that we're old, Lance, but we've <laughs> we've been through this cycle before. Right. Um, you know, in the late '90s, when you know there was a tech bubble that that kind of crashed, we're kind of seeing that on the prop tech side as well. Right. Uh, the it feels you, that you, way. You, you, you saw kind of some of the missteps that that Zillow made. Yep. Um, there are some. You know, we talked last time I was here about some of the uh, some of the uh, i buyers in that whole entire situation. Yep. Zillow is completely. Uh, exited out of that that marketplace, so which I still don't understand. Um, and, and we, I don't know that we've so much talked about the missteps. We acknowledged a year ago that Zillow and Open Door and Knock and others were in that market. Zillow exited what August ish. I still don't know why. Um, you know, well because they were taking a they were taking a, a bloodbath. Well, I understand. And, you know, I understand that. Which which but, which means that you know there are companies that are in that space that are not taking the same bloodbath. It just means that, you know, when you're an iBuyer, you are so driven by analytics. Right. And if your analytics are bad. I understand. But, but if they, I mean, what kind of a mistake do you have to make in 2021 to not make that mistake look like less of a mistake when you end the year at a 20% appreciation rate? Um, it seems like that 20% appreciation rate can make up for a lot of mistakes. Now, if the mistakes were more logistic, they don't have somebody to clean carpet, and they don't have somebody to cut grass, and that sort of stuff, it still seems like that could have been figured out. But at any rate... Well, I mean, they're, um, they're losing money on their mortgage side as well. So I, there's obviously there's, there's some lot. things going on internally that uh, Rich Barton's got to paddle extra right. hard to, to right the ship on that A lot going side. on there. And I haven't looked at their stock prices, and we generally don't talk stock prices here on this, well, but, but and, they've and gotten creamed since, well, since they most, exited the iBuyer stuff. Most, most companies in the, the prop tech side have gotten creamed, right. and they've lost a ton of value. A ton. So yep. you know, maybe a little bit of the honeymoon is, is over on yeah. that side. Which, again, as a more traditional guy, I kind of, you know, I'm like, okay. That's fine. At some point, you know, you got to actually make money. Yeah. Right. Which is always that's always been my challenge. And I will leave any specific brokerages or or, or big companies, whether they're hedge funds or otherwise, out of it. But it's hard as an as an independent guy. At the end of the month, I got to balance my checkbook. I got to pay my bills, and I hope there's a little bit of profit. When you're competing against companies that their business plan is to lose hundreds of millions of dollars, whether that's to capture market share and then ultimately, you know, ride in and, and crush everybody else. But it it, it is. Not that you want to see some of these um, folks fail, but at the same time, it's like, geez, you know, can you at least turn a profit? Um, which, again, not getting back to the, the DOJ and what FTC is doing, but it's very interesting. So on that topic, so this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give everybody my two cents worth on this. I've been very involved 
at the CAR level and the local level for a very long time. However, I pulled back a little bit ago, mm -hmm. okay, a couple years ago. And hey, let's get some new guys in there. You know, I've been doing that for 30 years and, you know, I'm getting great. I'm that guy that I used to look at and says, what are you doing here? Make room for some young kids. Yeah. So I did it. I stepped back. But I got to tell you, as somebody I think I'm pretty connected, just stepping back a year, year and a half, and I still read all the posts and I'm still reading the blogs and I'm trying to follow up. I get, it's very, it, it's crazy how quickly that you can become like, I mean, some of the stuff you're telling me, I'm not kind of embarrassed. I should know this. I should know exactly what these are. I mean, gosh, this affects our business big time. So anyway, so I guess I'm, I'm imploring the audiences to, um, you know, we got to gather that information. That's yeah. one of the reasons I'm excited that CAR is going back to live meetings because even though I'm not on the directors um, this year or who knows what the future holds, I mean, heck, they're generally open meetings. Let me yeah. go up there, spend a little bit of time, sit in on some of these meetings and, and figure out what the heck's going on. So crazy, interest, interest. So what? Any anything else litigation wise out there? I mean, that's you kind of threw a hand grenade there on that one. But you know, I think that's probably the the primary pieces that we're seeing. You know, there's lawsuits that are going after the clear cooperation policy, which yep. is the the you know mandatory submission into the multiple listing service, yep. and uh, and the case that we're involved in, uh, the. The, the federal district court ruled in our favor and threw the case out. Right. Um, basically, you know, but it has gone back to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, we've had hearings in the last month or so, and the Ninth Circuit will make a decision on whether or not these guys can take another bite at the apple. Right. Well, we'll move off the litigation stuff, but I, I, I will, just so there's no you know, misunderstanding of my position as it relates to these things, you know, we are generally in a, in a very disclosure heavy business mm -hmm. and if you're not disclosing you know material defects then you you've you've, you've gone outside the lines yeah from a commission perspective if at the end of the day they're going to say hey we will allow which is, I got those words passing my lips is just terrible but if the government will allow us to pay what a consumer is willing to pay the industry then i think we'll be just fine even if that means everybody gets to know what everybody gets paid i think we'll be just fine um, if for well, no other reason, but well, just just to finish my thought because I wanted to say this a minute. I got lost when 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 they came up with all those changes when we were putting out the um, the loan disclosures mm -hmm. and the loan estimate. And I one of those changes that came in and says now on the actual CE, it's going to tell the buyer what the broke the what their commission is, what their agent's commission is. And we all kind of lost our minds. Oh my gosh, you know. And the worry was is that now that the buyer saw that, they would now have the opportunity now near the end of escrow, to turn to their buyer's agent and say, hey, Art, wow, I had no idea you were making that much money. Um, will you pay this and pay that and pay that? And does that happen? I'm, I'm sure, of course it does. But I got to tell you, I looked at that and I thought, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. We are going to have a flood of buyer um, negotiations prior to close of escrow trying for a buyer to sit back and say, hey, I want a piece of that commission. My experience has not been that at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, it just hasn't been that way. So disclosing to a buyer what the overall commission is, I'm not afraid of that at all. Um, you know, just be transparent. Say, this is what it is. And, and maybe we have a paragraph or two that says an argument could be made that that amount is being lumped into your loan or lumped into the sales price. And um, if that's ultimately a disclosure that's made, you know, so be it. We'll let the chips fall where they may. Well, and, it, and you're under that disclosure now. The National right. Association of Realtors... Uh, decided to push those rules out, uh, even though there was no consent decree. The National Association of Realtors made those changes in November, and we've instituted uh, three so, of the four uh, parts of the, the right. consent decree. So, and, and is that kind of what they're hoping for? Do we have smart people negotiating this, by the way? Yeah. I mean, the National Association of Realtors is, is working as much as they possibly can. Uh, as I said, I think the FTC is... is uh, dealing with some different elements of the technology industry, such as Google, Facebook... Uh, you know, meta and, you know, all of the stuff that's going on with, with all of that. And right. the attention level is not on the real estate industry as much right. as it will be. Okay. I'm going to ask you to put your forecaster hat on. We might just blow right past this if you want. So we talk in the context of Zillow, and that's, I don't care about Zillow. Um, we saw general appreciation in, you know, throw a dot at a board or throw an arrow at a, at a map, and you're going to see about a 20% appreciation in real estate values in 2020. Nobody expected that. First year COVID, you know, we're all panic attacking. Mm -hmm. um, more or less, pretty much similar number in 2021, another 20% appreciation closing out last year. There's been some economists that I've seen recently. Um, this is maybe before Russia and, 
in Ukraine and some of these you know, very, very large inflation numbers that we're talking about. But basically saying, hey, we're going to see some big numbers. Um, you know, words like unsustainable come to mind. But, I mean, do you have any, any not necessarily thoughts on where we're going to end up in 2022? I mean, I'm not asking you to say, oh, yeah. And by the way, CAR projection is a 5% increase in property values in the state, selling 5% fewer homes, 5% fewer houses, 5% higher sales price. I don't know. Sounds reasonable. I mean, you certainly can make an argument that that would be well or work. work. But um, any, any thoughts on that? Because I got to tell you, I am becoming increasingly uncomfortable with, you know, I mean, what, okay, let's just suppose we have a 10% or a 15, there's a couple of economists out there saying another 15% appreciation yeah. in real estate values this year. Okay, inflation driven, I suppose. Um, man, at some point, what, when did the chair get pulled out of that party? And, and any, do you even want to talk about that or? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist, so I, I, I can't really give you anything other than as I said, 25 years of watching this industry go through right. it, it's well, like... Well, that's something. You know, and... That's why I'm asking you, 25 years. Yeah, and, and you know, this is the longest period of time that we've had in between, you know, a, a, a trough and a, and a peak. Right. You know, so at some point, you got to think that this is going to turn. Right. Especially, especially as Americans, you know, are facing all of these pressures on their, their buying dollars and... You know, it's increasingly difficult for them to 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 make ends meet. Right. And if you're looking, you look at our Orange County market and the average uh, prices in Orange County. Uh, it's it's insanity to me right. that that a you know working family can can survive yeah. in in those elements. So, I just did I did a market snapshot. And, and I don't work this market. Don't ask me why. Actually, I know why I did it, but I don't work this market. I did Huntington Beach. Mm -hmm. A million fifty, yeah. me medium price, and again, Huntington Beach is beautiful. But I mean, what you're buying now for a million fifty is 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 not a new house. It's not one of those beach houses that's three stories and you know super skinny. It's I mean, those are you can't touch that for a million fifty. You're buying an old, an older, you know, not run down, but I mean, for a million bucks, you know, I mean, wow. I mean, heck, even in Marino Valley, I mean, good lord, I just sold a two bedroom, one bath home in Marino Valley for four hundred thousand dollars. You know, you know. I, you know, I, I sold a house in Walnut in 2006. Yep. And uh, that house just sold again, and it sold for over a million dollars. Right. And I was like, yep. <laughs> that's... Interesting. That's insanity. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're looking at, you know, doubling of the price during that, that yep. time frame, so... Well, we'll put a button on this and then maybe segue a little bit different, but I'm, I've been saying up until recently, I mean, I mean, like, even like within maybe a, a, a month ago... If I'm a consumer, don't worry about that so much. You're looking at a sub-3% interest rate or a, a yeah. low 3% interest rate. Hey, you know, these are record-setting rates. You know, look at the payment. Don't necessarily get hung up on that million-dollar price tag in Huntington or whatever it happens to be because you're basically getting close to, you know, free money. Yeah. Well, things have changed pretty yeah. dramatically. So that's, yeah. my, that's my main thing with these prices. If, if we, I, mean, I think yesterday or maybe even this morning in my sales meeting, um, I mean, the, we're at a 4.5% interest rate. By the way, today is March 15th, 2022. So we'll be looking back at this a year, two, three, four, five years from now, and we'll either say, <laughs> boy, if I could only get a 4.5% yeah. interest rate today, or they'll say, oh, it was just a bubble and we're down at 1.5% you know, interest rates. I mean, who, know, who, who would have thought we would yeah. have seen 2% interest rates? I, if, yeah, never. None never. of us. N nobody's, nobody's ever seen that. So. No, right, right. And will we ever again? Yeah, who knows? Um, so I don't know. I just have concerns about the sustainability of it. I mean, it's it's not doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, you know, twenty percent, twenty percent, maybe double digit. At some point, we gotta we gotta slow this down. So. Wages aren't rising at the same level. Um, prices, inflation is, yeah. You know, I just saw the wholesale number for February. You know, at ten percent. Yep. For February, that right. wasn't. You know, that was can't blame that, that on Ukraine and Russia. No, and, that, that, and that's not annualized. That's right. that's that's one month's inflation. Yep. You know, it, the highest number in, in forty years. I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just think that it, at some point, everything that goes up eventually yep. comes down. Well, the Fed's meeting today and tomorrow. I think they're going to announce tomorrow on the sixteenth of March. 
um, you know, those in the know seem to think it's going to be a quarter percent uh, basis point raise yeah. on the Fed funds rate. It seems like that's all baked in. Um, I just wonder if if we're this this there's so many things that have gotten so big. I almost it almost feels like on the regulatory perspective, whether it's the Fed or it almost feels like it's out of their control. That I just don't know that they really have the ability to kind of pull this in and. What does that ultimately mean? I agree. It's I like a know. hippo on a skateboard going downhill. I mean, at some point, the, the slope's a little bit too right. much for the hippo to stay on. So. Yep. Okay, so let's segue into inventory. And I know I, I, I don't want to throw you a curveball. You mentioned, hey, I didn't pull the inventory numbers, but we're just going to talk gen, gen, generally. Inventory levels I are down. I, I don't have to pull them to know that there is That they're, they're zero. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we, I mentioned er, before the interview, and I'm actually quoting you, from last year's interview, I watched earlier this morning, and we were talking about you know a month supply of inventory, and I think a year ago, I think I said at the time, oh, it's a it's a thirty day supply, and you immediately said no, and we both simultaneously said much less than month supply of inventory, because, yeah. and I think it's even whatever whatever it was a year ago, it's it's even much less than that. I mean, I think we have a zero supply, zero day supply of inventory. Everything that's listed is basically. It might take them, um, and I know this probably violates a rule or two with CRMLS. It might show active, and then it took us two, three weeks to actually go from active to pending. But when you're still looking at multiple, multiple offers, you're negotiating offers on day one. Yeah, and you may not put it pending until day 21. But at the end of the day, it, we have no inventory. It's zero days. Um, which then says, well, how can prices go down when we have no inventory because we still have a line of buyers out there yeah. that's a mile long. So and now it is early in the season. Um, so we should start to see inventory go up. But when you compare year over year, pretty much anywhere in CRMLS, and again, I use broker metrics. Mm -hmm. Is that a good program to use, by the way? Yeah, um, I'm well, yeah. Okay. It was at one point Teradatum, but right. uh, you know it's been transferred over yeah. to Lone Wolf. So. Lone Wolf bought them, yeah. yeah. Uh, Broker Wolf, yeah. Lone Wolf bought everything, basically. Yeah. That's a whole other conversation. Okay, so Lone Wolf has bought Teradatum. Um, um, what was my program I just said? Broker um, Metrics. Broker Metrics, thank you. So I use that, and I've been tracking inventory pendings and all that stuff. It pulls straight out of mm -hmm. your, I always call it your data. Yeah. It pulls straight out of your data. And man, I got to tell you, those year-over-year -year inventory, I mean, we were bitching about inventory levels two years ago, three years ago. And I, man, we would kill to have the level of inventory yeah. we had two years, three years ago. It's yeah. just, it's nuts. So um, I don't know. I just, I mean, I've asked everybody and I will continue to ask everybody that I'm sitting down with over the next couple of weeks what inventory looks like and everybody's like, yeah, it is what it is. Um, and it doesn't appear to be anything that's gonna change it. Um, where are the buyer, where are the sellers gonna go? You know, I have, I have agents in my office, don't do this, but I understand why you do it. You know, taking listings with, you know, subject to the seller, finding a replacement home. And, you know, tell, and what happens if they don't? Because it's possibly that they won't be able to. Are they prepared to move in with mom and dad or rent or do something? And most of the time the answer is no. So anyway, it's just a mess. I'm ranting. I should probably ask you a question in here somewhere. Yeah, well, uh, you so, know, that's one of the, you know, one of the things that I think the value add that MLSs really need to kind of look at going forward is is some of this offer management uh, systems for the community as a whole. Right. Uh, it, it would be interesting to know what the hit rate is for for uh, for consumers on uh, on their purchases at this point. So, you know, how, yeah. many, how many homes do you put offers on before you actually? It's tough. It's 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 insane, you know. Yeah, it's, anecdotally it's, is all that I can rely upon in talking with brokers like yourself. But you know, there's you know there's stories of people you know putting fifty offers out there with still not uh, pulling right. a house in. So. Right, right, and 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 that's 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 hard on buyers. The whole experience. It's I mean, come on, it's supposed to be fun, right? Yeah. At least it used to be. It is one of the most you know largest purchases of most mm -hmm. people's life. But at the same time. You know, it, it shouldn't be the most stressful, you know, oh, my God, my agent called me. There's a house available that I like. If I don't write an offer in two hours, you know, 5% above list, I have no chance of getting it. And mm -hmm. even at that, I know I'm going to be competing against 13 other people. It's, yeah, I don't know what the hit rate is, but it's it's, it's like winning the lottery these yeah. days. You know, you had mentioned, again, before, we, we did like a three-minute pre-interview interview, but you were saying there's a 60% a of the current agent's CRMLS members, um, board members, that have never really experienced a market other than just this, you know, raging bull that we've been on. Yeah. Um, 
and maybe those agents are in for you know, a little bit of a surprise. But, but, but before you answer that, though, I would say those same agents have never experienced a normal market where they weren't yeah. competing against, you know, I don't even know what's normal anymore. I mean, if it's been that yeah. way for 12 years, I mean, is normal, you know, a listing that stays on the market for, for three, four months and gets one offer? I don't know. Those, that seems, that's like, that's like 1992 stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't have the answer to that. I, it's, it's, being in this business as long as I have, I, I still don't know that I truly understand what's going on right now. Right. You know, it, because it, it, it's outside of the realm of what we used to consider a normal market. Right. And that cyclical, you know, every nine to 11 years that, you know, we'd, we'd hit a trough and go to the peak and yep. come up with a new trough at, at some, at some level. And it just, it hasn't, it hasn't uh, reacted that way, right. especially, uh, you know, and maybe it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, like you were talking about as, as a seller, where do I go? So therefore I'm not going to sell. So therefore that affects inventory and, are there more buyers chasing homes than there were, you know, five years ago? Probably not. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's just. I don't think so. You know, we've got this dynamic in the, the country that, you know, you would have thought at this point that, you know, your baby boomers or, you know, the kids are, unless they're boomerangs, are, are, are headed out the door or yep. looking to, you know, maybe transition into to smaller places or things along those lines. And there's just not that capability. It, it just, it's gonna long-term have an effect on the right. market. Well, at the end of the day, we need more houses. Yeah. You know, we interviewed Ido Benzivi, finally. I haven't been trying to get Ido back in studio for, you know, certainly pre-COVID and the year before that. Um, he's building houses. He's got, he's, got, he's got a chunk of houses, privately owned land in Reno Valley. And, you know, assuming that market timing is even close to reasonably, but, but there's not enough, you know, there, and, you know, Dio Horton and Lewis and all those guys, I mean, they're building, the, they're building some. But gosh darn, we're so far behind the, the what's required to fulfill the demand. I mean, I just I'm channeling Joel Singer for the last mm -hmm. 25 years. It's like you know we're just not building enough housing, and what we are building is rental housing. Um, yeah, yeah. Speaking of rental housing, um, you guys are still you're still doing the rent. Wait, help me out. We're still putting rentals in Sierra MLS. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, oh, I know what the difference is. Okay, but now Zillow doesn't play. We have to, we have to pay Zillow to put them on the rental side if, we're, if we want them to push to Zillow. Um, that, that, dyna that dynamic is changing as well. Oh, it is. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so, we'll have to talk offline about that because yeah. that's a little bit of heartburn for me. But getting back to the rental, and if you don't know, that's fine because I didn't prep you for this. Um, is that percentage of rental housing that's in the MLS, is that changed dramatically at all? Or is it just, is it no, just kind I think of a it, number? No, I think still, it still plugs along at the, the same percentage. I mean, if... if if we're getting 10% of the rental market into the multiple listing service, yeah. you know, I'd be kind of surprised. Yeah. You know, primarily because a lot of it is, especially as you're, you're, you know, a lot of this is transitioned into some of the larger, you know, corporate investments and right. larger, you know, right. uh, they, larger bigger companies right. that that handle these these rental sides, and they yep. typically don't. They don't. Well, they don't. They don't need to. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, right now, I mean, we're we're not a small management company in the Inland Empire. We have like three houses available to rent right now. Three. Yeah. I mean, the inventory challenge on the rental side is just as bad, yeah. if not worse, than the than the resale side. Uh, you know, we could compare a similar book of business um, ten years ago. We had fifty. I mean, we're, we're there's less than ten percent of the inventory for rentals now, and we only do single family. We don't even deal with the big multifamily yeah. stuff. So, crazy. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to ask you another question that you may not be able to answer, but we talked about these sixty percent of the agents. Um, because you guys know if you follow my stuff, I've got my 95-5 model, my play on the 80-20 rule. 80% mm -hmm. of the business is done by 20% of the agents. I, baloney. I mean, it's 95% it's of the agents is done by 5% of the agents, or it's somewhere in there. Depending upon the pocket, the numbers are going to change, of course. Um, but my, 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 the message I'm trying to send with that is, is the number of truly professional agents that are in the business, that are engaged, are providing a service which I feel they need to be adequately compensated for, whichever they can get their clients to agree to, is getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so my question, 
Um, if you haven't joined the board and paid your dues, you, did you shut a whole bunch of people off in the last couple of weeks? Or do you even get involved in that? No, I, I, I actually watch the figures pretty closely. Okay. Um, we are, we're up year over year, up, up 5%. Wow. So, and you know, I go back. I go back 25 years in these figures. So, yeah. you know, I can tell the difference by the way that we track whether it's organic or I've brought new associations in, yep. you know, anything along those lines. But yeah, five percent. Uh, and you know, and that makes perfect sense because that, as much as we like to outperform the market, we're doing a lot of recruiting within our offices, and we're partnered up with a real estate school. And man, the the interest and the demand. Mm -hmm from people wanting to get their real estate license and joining our firm or other firms, it's certainly 5% or more. So that yeah. makes perfect sense. So even though you might have turned out two of two people off, you, you signed three people more up. Yeah, and, and, in be. a hot market, that's always always been the case. Right. Um, we've averaged over the last five years between 5 and 10% organic growth yep. every year. Yeah, wow. Well, that's a whole other number. I mean, on the backside, that's another number to look at. How many people are planning to get their real estate license? Yeah. Um, I mean, it truly is one of those those underlying indicators. If you kind of follow that trend in membership at CAR, although that doesn't always work because sometimes membership is up and unit sales are down. You've seen those charts mm -hmm. as well. But anyway, all right, man. Well, Thank here you, we sir. are. Here we are again. Yeah. You know, 2022. Well, next year we're going to be in studio. Um, we'll try to get all the gang back together, and, and hopefully we'll get you back and we'll – See if love, anything we said makes any sense. Yeah, we'll see whether or not we're still in business. Yeah, really. Right? Yeah. Okay, guys, Art is, I think, our fourth or fifth speaker that we presented, and we've got at least seven or eight more, so we're going to be rolling these out, so just continue to watch. We were shooting this on the 15th. I think we'll have you posted up on the 16th or 17th. So more to come, and thank you for watching.